else? Just me? All right. Are we, are we doing this thing? Are we good to go? All right. Hey, I think we're, I think we're live, uh, live streaming at Crossroads. This is just as big as when God parted the Red Sea. I think this is a big deal. It's us and about 12 people in the room right now, and we're going to do a little praying tonight because that's what it's all about. Um, I love this quote by Eugene Peterson. I've been thinking about it this week. He said, a changed world begins with us, and a changed us begins when we pray. And, and I love that. I think that's what we're called to. And so over the last three months, we've found a new normal, and we found different ways to express our faith. It really gets back to the root of our faith, which is relationships. And so let me tell you what tonight's going to look like. We're just going to take about 25 to 30 minutes, and we're going to pray. We're going to go before the throne of God in the name of Jesus, and we're going to say, help us, because right now in the world around us, we need some help, and it's pretty obvious. And as we start gathering again on Sundays, we want to recognize that prayer changes us, and because we are changed, the world sees more of the gospel. And so what we're going to do format-wise is I'm going to talk for about three minutes at a time, and then I'm going to give us about three minutes to pray, and I'll give you a prompt. And you might be thinking, three minutes to pray, good Lord, that's an eternity. And yeah, it might be. Or you might be thinking, I'm just getting started at three minutes. That's how I feel every Sunday after 40 minutes. Welcome. But I think that what we need to recognize and realize is sometimes it's good for us just to sit and pray. And if you ran out of words, sit in some silence and listen to what the Spirit is teaching you and telling you. And so like I said, we're going to have three different prompts, and then we'll call back in with a worship song. And so you can sit and sing, you can sit in silence, you can stand, you can do whatever you want at your house. But we're going to worship a little bit tonight because God is worthy of it. And as I was thinking about tonight, one verse kept popping up in my head. It's Colossians 1, 19 and 20. If you've got a Bible, you can go there. It goes like this. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, By making peace through the blood of the cross, through him, through Jesus, whether all things on earth or all things in heaven. And that that first phrase there when it says God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in Jesus so that he might reconcile all things, what that is right there is really the heartbeat of the gospel. It's the heartbeat of what the church is all about. It's the heartbeat of why we gather on Sundays, why we worship God in the first place. And we've talked about it a lot, but, but sometimes we miss the big picture of the gospel. We don't see the forest or the trees, and we make the gospel about heaven. And the gospel is not about heaven, and the scriptures are not about heaven. They are story of God reconciling his creation. The word there that's used by Paul literally means to make something back to a state of harmony, to bring something that has been broken whole again. And so when, when Paul talks about what the gospel is, He says the gospel is reconciliation through Jesus. And heaven is where that reconciliation is complete. But right here and right now, I think it's pretty obvious that we need some reconciliation. We we need some gospel in our lives. And as Christians, what we're called to do is live out that message of reconciliation in all spaces and places. That's why he says he's reconciling all things, not just your soul. He's reconciling your family and he's reconciling race relations, and he's reconciling our communities, and he's reconciling a broken culture, and he's reconciling sickness, and he's reconciling death. It says that Jesus is a reconciling God, and that's the story of the Bible. And so we're going to start tonight just by praying for reconciliation, by praying that God brings broken things back to a new state of harmony, because that's what the scriptures tell us he's doing. Slowly but surely, as we are changed into the image of Jesus. And so here's the first prayer prompt. I'd ask you in your house or, you know, the 12 people here, let's pray for reconciliation. Let's pray for reconciliation in our country and in our relationships and in our racial divides and just quite frankly in all of our politics because we need it. Let's pray for reconciliation that God might bring back broken things to harmony. So spend three minutes and just say some prayers or sit in silence and then I'll close this in just a second.
God, we thank you that you're a God of reconciliation. That's the heartbeat of the gospel. That's what you started in Genesis and are finishing in Revelation. We're thankful in the middle of a broken culture that you call us to a better picture of what will be, a hope for the future that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we pray as followers of Jesus that we might be reconcilers, that we might show people what it means to mend the brokenness through the power that only the Holy Spirit can give us, that overcomes all the division in the world right now. May we be a reconciling church. May people see hope in how we live. May people see hope in how we talk to one another. May people see hope as we talk about Jesus that is here to reconcile all things and give us a picture of what life was meant to be. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Well, I I figure the best way to open in song tonight would be to confess that we need the Lord. That's what prayer is, right? When we are proclaiming that we need him to do something or proclaiming that we need him to hold all things together like scripture says, ultimately that we need him. So let's sing, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come and I confess that bowing here I find my rest and without you fall apart the one that guides my heart. We confess that we need you, oh God. Lord, I need you.
text in Colossians goes on. It says that God was pleased to have the fullness of his deity dwell in the Son so that all things might be reconciled to him. And he says he's reconciling all things to himself by making peace through the blood of the cross. So, so if reconciliation is the heartbeat of the gospel, grace is the lifeblood of the gospel. Because we don't pay for the sins that we brought, for the brokenness that we bring to our world. It's paid for through what Jesus did. If reconciliation is the heartbeat of the gospel, grace is the lifeblood. It's the currency through which the gospel culture is traded. And so when we talk about kind of where we're at culturally right now, I follow a leader that says often that in a, in a distracted culture like today that we're pulled by 17 different things every minute, in a distracted culture, focus is a superpower. And, and right now, I think that we have a divided culture. And with a divided culture, I think grace is needed all the more to defeat the division that comes from being so divided. From the, from, the, from the damage that comes from being so divided, that's where grace steps in and paints a picture of what Jesus did for us. And so as people that follow Jesus, what we need to realize is that we need grace. And we need to live with grace and love with grace and show others what grace looks like. I think when we talk about grace, sometimes we're afraid that, that if we're gracious, then people don't hear truth. And that's not the biblical picture of what grace is. Grace is a tone that's taken, that doesn't sacrifice or, or doesn't in any way diminish the truth that we tell about Jesus. Grace is how we tell the message of Christ. It's how we say it in love and in the context of relationships. Grace is how we listen to others. Grace is how we speak to others. I was listening to a podcast this week with an African-American lawyer from Dallas, and he says, what can we do next? And um, he said, well, one thing we can do is when we listen to one another, maybe instead of listening for the things we disagree with, listen for the things we agree with first. <laughs> and I thought that was a really powerful just way to live more, to listen more with grace in a divided time. Because as followers of Christ, we remember that no matter what side of the political spectrum you fall on or what side of the coronavirus debate you fall on or whatever side you fall on, that we are united through something far better, far greater, far more powerful than what divides us. And reconciliation requires grace. It does ultimately with our souls in Jesus and it does every single day as we live. If reconciliation is the heartbeat of the gospel, grace is the lifeblood. And so we are called to be a people of grace. You see it all the time throughout the Old Testament. In the Hebrew, the term grace that we see in the New Testament is translated as favor. Some 20 odd and changed times in the Old Testament. And what that literally means, the idiom means that God shows favor upon you or shows his face to you. Or steps into the places where you feel pain or forgotten. And he says, I'm going to be there for you. Grace looks like care, love, affection, and time. Grace looks like loving well. And so I think right now, of all the things that we need to recognize, we recognize that our gospel begins with grace. It, it starts with God stepping into our brokenness and saying, this is not what I created and this is not what will be eternally. And so we prayed for reconciliation and we're also going to pray for an increased measure of grace. Because I think the first thing that goes in a divided culture is the attitude of grace with which we operate, the currency of the culture of the gospel that we live out and live into. And so we're going to take the next three minutes and we're going to pray for an increased measure of grace. Pray that we might live with grace, love with grace, and increase our capacity for grace so that people might see the grace of God. Pray that we might be a people of grace.
God, may you, may you increase our awareness of our need for grace so that we might be more gracious towards others. May we remember our poverty of spirit so that we remember that we need just as much Jesus as everybody else, just as much grace as everybody else. As the church, might we lead with grace in how we speak and how we listen and how we disagree because there's a way to do that graciously too. And might it point back to a God of grace, the currency of our gospel, the, the lifeblood of the gospel of reconciliation. May we be a people that's known for their grace so that then we might have an avenue to speak truth that is Jesus and all the spaces and places in our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. I've heard it said that death is the great leveler. And I think that there's some truth to that, but in the kingdom, I think that it works slightly differently. Grace and mercy are the great levelers. There's that story where the woman who was a sinner is wiping Jesus' feet, and the disciples say, how, how can you let someone like that touch you? And he said, well, she loves me. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but, but basically he says, she's been forgiven much, and therefore she loves much. And I, I think that that's something that when we look at our own lives, we recognize that that's exactly where we find ourselves, that we all are in need of grace. That's the leveler inside the kingdom. And so the next song we're singing is called All the Poor and Powerless, and, and it is a picture of that, where we have all the poor and powerless, all the lost, all the lonely, and all the thieves will come confess and know that you're holy. That's the picture. That's all of us. Each of us is, has been lost and lonely and, and poor and powerless and and maybe we haven't physically stolen something, but, but that's where we find ourselves, that all in need of God's grace. So let's, let's sing that.
last prompt comes from where the verse ends. It says that it's all done because of the reconciliation work of Jesus. And it says at the very last part of 20, through Jesus, whether all things on earth are in heaven. So it says this is how all that happens. Through Jesus, all things are reconciled on earth and in heaven. And that phrase is, is, is just really big. <laughs> I think over the last three months, what we've seen is people exposed to their own fragility and their own need in ways they never thought they would be before. I think you've seen a different world that we never thought would exist because the things we put our trust in betrayed us. I think that's why you've seen the movement of Jesus grow in our communities, in this church, and in other churches across the country because all at once we recognize as an independent people that maybe we don't have all the answers, that maybe we don't have all the things we need, that maybe we do need. And, and the beauty of the story of Christ is not that he calls us to be better people and kinder parents and more loyal husbands and people that don't lie and people that are compassionate and kind. The beauty of followers of Jesus is that those things come because Jesus is our solution to problems that we've created. I follow a pastor and had a conversation with him once and he was leading this little small home church movement in Colorado and he had a really good marriage and this one person that didn't know Jesus at all started coming to the group and after about six months he said, hey, it looks like your marriage is really good and the pastor said, it is. And he said, I need to know how you got a good marriage like that and he said, if I'm going to tell you about how my marriage is good, I have to tell you about Jesus. And so what this passage does is it reminds us that right now in the middle of the unknown, we're going to take different steps to get us to be reconciled. We're going to pass bills and we're going to watch Netflix documentaries and we're going to read about reconciliation in scripture and we're going to study and we're going to donate and we're going to hopefully find a vaccine. We're going to do all these things that hopefully stable up the shaken culture that we have just felt like betrayed us. But you know, in the end, what Jesus says is if all those things, if all your steps and actions towards reconciliation aren't planted in me, then it will fail and I don't. And so as Christians... As followers of Jesus, what we hold on to is this message of reconciliation. What we know is that if it's not rooted in the person and work of Jesus, it won't last. And so that's why Paul writes here and he says, this is the heartbeat of the gospel. This is the lifeblood of the gospel. And don't forget where it's found. And it's different than all the other places that you can look for, for security and for joy and for happiness and for peace. He says, look to Jesus. And so we see people find other ways to fix problems, but it's not an ultimate solution. It's just the step on the right direction that ultimately point to what Jesus is doing here and will do in the future. And so our last prayer is really simple. We just want to pray that people see the hope that Jesus brings, specifically the reconciliation found not through other stuff, but through the security of Christ who rose from the dead. So our last prayer prompt is we want to pray that people might see their need and respond to the specific hope and reconciliation that Jesus and only Jesus brings. We want to pray that people find the hope of Christ specifically. So you might know some people and you might know some groups and you might pray for our communities that the influence of Jesus increases as we trust him over all the other things to fix the problems that we have now. So let's pray that we might know specifically Jesus and that his influence might grow in our lives.
Jesus, I'm thankful that you're our hope. <laughs> I'm thankful that when other things fade and fall away and betray us, you don't. I'm thankful that as followers of your way, that we can trust you. And that as we lean into your goodness, while all the other stuff might fade away, it doesn't shake our confidence. It doesn't shake our hope. God, I pray that other people see that. I pray that people that don't know you see you for the first time, find hope in you and trust you. I pray that people might be saved through the work of Jesus right here, right now, in the middle of the messy middle or the unknown because we have such an unshakable hope in the work of Christ. So God, I pray your kingdom expands. The influence of Jesus continues to grow because you are good and you are trustworthy. And may we be a church that yells that from all of the platforms that we have that remains secure in the middle of a shaky world. Might we find hope in the one who gives hope and the one hope that never goes away. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5 says, So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look, what is new has come. And all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's trespasses against them. And he has given us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making his plea through us, we plead with you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Now, in that, in that passage, he talks about ambassadors. And I think that what that means is we found ourselves in a, in a new kingdom. We've become this creation, and now we are one race, one people. We're believers. And as such, we have things that mark us out as all believers of all different skin tones and all different eye shapes and all different countries where we've come from. We're citizens in heaven, and, and the one thing that marks us out is what we believe as believers in Christ. So I thought a great way to end the night would be to proclaim exactly those things that we believe. We're going to sing this, I believe.
That's what we got for tonight. If you're here, hey, thanks guys for joining us. It's been so good to see some people. I noticed you're all about 30 rows back. I don't spit that far. And you should clear by the second row. If you watched online, thank you so much. This is kind of our test run, and we decided to pray. And if this keeps working, man, who says miracles don't happen? It's going to turn us into a charismatic church. You know that? Um, all that said, we're going to try this live thing again on Sunday morning. So you can watch from your house. Or if you want to, we're typically a late sign-up church. Let's not be a late sign-up church. If you want to come to service this Sunday, there's a few spots left, and so if you wait, there might not be any. So go online and sign up for us so we know we have room for you, and you can find our live stream on Sunday starting at 10 a.m., and then you can watch it after that as many times as you want. Have a fantastic Wednesday, and I cannot wait. It's Thursday. Have a fantastic Thursday, and I can't wait to see you on Sunday. <laughs>